So hello year 12 and I hope that you found that revision of Hess cycles topic 8 energy changes um, that actually you knew most of the stuff and it was just a few things that you needed to tweak. So this video is going to go through the multiple choice questions, the ones that were particularly badly answered and then the second half of this video will look at the mark schemes to the longer answer questions, those 50 marks that were set on Friday. By all means pause this video halfway through and come back to this when you have tackled those longer answer questions. Looking at the results um, from um, the, the set of multiple choice questions, we can see well done to 12E there um, with a high completion ratio in time for me to record this video. Um, 12B, um, though, you know, 70% completion, 92%. I think this week we could hold 12B up as the model class. Okay, so let's have a look at these. In an experiment to measure the enthalpy change of a reaction involving gases, which of the following conditions must always be kept constant? 80% of you got this right, um, but quite a few people going for wrong answers. One of those things you need to know is that these things are only accurate if the pressure is kept constant. When we measure the enthalpy changes, we often do need to record a change in temperature. Um, if you think about the experiments you did, um, you were typically measuring a change in temperature in order to get at the enthalpy change of a reaction. But what must be constant is the pressure. Not so important if you're working in solids or liquids or solutions, um, but with gases it is essential that the pressure is kept constant. For which of the following changes is the value of delta H negative? This means exothermic. So it's going to release energy. So um, removing an electron from potassium, no, that's going to take in energy in order to do that. Splitting two ions up. So potassium chloride solid, um, turning it into ions, gaseous ions, no, that's going to require energy. And splitting up chlorine into two chlorine atoms, no, that's going to require energy. The one that is going to happen naturally is the electron being attracted towards an empty, or, or sorry, a, a neutral chlorine atom. That is actually going to give out energy, and so that is the one with the negative delta H. Okay, question four. The reaction between hydrogen and fluorine is highly exothermic. This is mainly because, well, let's have a think about this. So fluorine, fluorine and hydrogen, hydrogen reacting together to give two FHs. If something's highly exothermic, it means that the energy given out forming the new bonds is much larger than the energy taken in when breaking the original bonds. So in other words, these must be quite weak and these bonds must be quite strong. So which ones match that? The FF bond is weak and the HF bond is strong. Yep, that's right. The FF bond is strong and the HF bond is weak. No, that would give us the opposite. FF bond is weak and the HF and HH bonds are strong. Um, well, if we've got strong HH bonds, then that's going to minimise the difference in energy between the two, so that doesn't work. And the FF bond is strong and the HF and HH bonds are weak. No, that definitely isn't true, otherwise it would take a lot of energy to break that as well. So it's the first one, that the FF bond is weak and the HF bond is strong. Okay, four definitions, enthalpy of reaction, mean bond enthalpy, enthalpy of combustion and bond enthalpy. Which enthalpy change is represented by methane splitting up into CH3 and H+. Well, we have broken one of the bonds, but only one of them. That actually gives us a bond enthalpy, so that is D. Most of you getting that correct, but only 82%. A lot of people 
um, going for the other three answers. Now, if we split this methane molecule up and we break all of the bonds, remember each bond being broken is going to give a slightly different energy. Removing the second hydrogen, the third and the fourth is going to give you slightly different um, energies. But overall, that will give us the mean bond enthalpy, or rather four times the mean bond bond enthalpy which is why q is just the mean bond enthalpy so that is c it's an average of all the ch bonds which enthalpy change is represented by r this is ethene and an oxygen well half an oxygen molecule forming this species lots of people in fact about a quarter of you went for this being an enthalpy of combustion but it's not it's not complete combustion So remember that in these cases, the enthalpy of combustion is completely reacting with oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water in this case. So it is clearly just A, an enthalpy of reaction. Uh, only three quarters of you getting that right. For which of the following reactions is the enthalpy change equal to the bond enthalpy of HI? And remember the bond enthalpy is where you split the bonds forming gaseous atoms. Yep, I've got that there. The bond dissociation enthalpy is the energy needed to break one mole of the bond to give separated atoms everything in the gas state. Well, this is giving molecules, so it's not that. This is giving molecules, so it's not that. This is giving ions, so it's not that. It must therefore be C, separating hydrogen iodide into hydrogen atom and an iodine atom in the gas state. Again, which equation represents the reaction for which the enthalpy change is the mean bond enthalpy of the CH bond? Okay, here we've got a quarter CH4 going to a quarter carbon and hydrogen. That's looking good so far. This one, we're forming a hydrogen molecule. That's not atoms. This one, we're forming hydrogen molecule. That's not atoms. This one, um, splitting methane up into carbon and four hydrogen atoms. This is four times the CH bond enthalpy. So although this looks good, it's not actually correct, and it is A. The standard enthalpy changes of formation of some sulphur species are the following. The enthalpy of atomization of sulphur is in kilojoules per mole. Okay, this is a bit of a trick question and something that you don't really need to know at year 12, but atomization is forming um, gaseous atoms from something. So in this case, we would be looking at an eighth of S8 solid going to um, sulphur gas. And given that S8 solid has no enthalpy of formation, um, then the change there atomizing the S8 to sulphur is just the enthalpy of formation. So sorry if you spent quite a while on that, but the answer is just C, 279 kilojoules per mole. This one's a bit more familiar to you guys. Um, we're trying to work out the complete combustion. Well, we've got the equation for the complete combustion of butanone, and we know that going in that direction is minus 2440. But we can imagine making these things from elements. So if we do that, then making the, the products on the right, that is 4 times minus 394 plus 4 times minus 286, because that's the enthalpy of formation of 4 carbon dioxides and 4 waters. Up here, we've got 5.5 times the enthalpy of formation of oxygen, but that's 0. So this is just the delta HF of butanone. 
And this is what we want to find out. Well, going from here to here is the same as going up to the products and then back again. So that is uh, delta H F but is four times minus three nine four plus four times minus two eight six. <laughs> Sorry, minus because we're going right to left against that minus two four forty. And if you plug that into a calculator, you get an answer of minus two hundred and eighty kilojoules per mole. <laughs> In other words, A. Many people getting that right. Over here, the standard enthalpy changes formation of carbon dioxide and methanoic acid and minus 394 kilojoules per mole and minus 409.8. Calculate the enthalpy change of that reaction. Okay, so we're giving enthalpy changes of formation. So again, we imagine making those from the elements. Going up here, hydrogen, there's no enthalpy of formation. Going up to carbon dioxide uh, is minus 394. And going up to methanoic acid is minus 409. We're interested in this enthalpy change, which is down this arrow and back up. So it's going with this number and against that number. So it is minus, minus 394 plus minus 409 which is uh, the same as 394 minus 409 in other words minus 15 kilojoules per mole hopefully the answer is b it is b and here uh, standard enthalpy changes combustion of carbon hydrogen and methane shown there which gives the correct value for the standard enthalpy change of formation of methane. Here, remember, you build things up, but you burn things down. So we're burning these down into CO2 and uh, 2H2O uh, in standard state, of course. So water is liquid. Burning carbon, minus 394. Uh, burning hydrogen, we've got two lots of minus 286. And here for methane is minus 891. Going left to right, which is what we're interested in, is the same as going with that arrow and against that arrow. So it is minus 394 minus 2 times 286. Uh, minus minus 891 which is plus 891 so the answer there is B again so this question was the worst answered on the entire um, set of multiple choice questions for those who have submitted their scores in the experiment performed to measure the enthalpy change for the reaction Copper ions and zinc going to copper and zinc ions. Three grams of zinc powder in excess was added to 30 centimetre cubed of copper sulphate solution of concentration one mole per dm cubed. The temperature rise of the mixture is 47.6 K. Assuming the heat capacity of the solution is 4.2 joules per Kelvin, the enthalpy change for the reaction. Okay, so in terms of the heat, the enthalpy is your 30 grams because we had 30 centimetres cubed of copper two sulphate solution. So um, Q equals MC delta T. So the specific E capacity is 4.2. The rise in temperature is 47.6. So that's where the 30 times 4.2 uh, times 47.6 comes from. Um, for those people who are looking at the 33s, no, because we're measuring the enthalpy change of the system. The math of the system is 30. Um, so it's got to be A or C. Now remember that the overall energy change delta H is minus Q over N. So we need to divide minus that number by the number of moles 
of copper two sulfate solution. Moles is conch times volume. The concentration is one. The volume is 0.03 decimeters cubed, so that's 0.03. So therefore, it is A. Uh, lots of people going for B because they're adding the mass of the zinc powder on. But no, we're interested in the mass of the water, the mass of the surroundings. And just like you didn't care about the mass of the copper sulfate you added in that experiment um, when you were looking at the difference between the anhydrous and the hydrated copper sulfate, it's just the mass of the water we're interested in. I thought I'd managed to hammer that home, but actually there's a huge number of you that haven't got that um, sorted yet. When 10 centimetres cubed of 2 mole per dm cubed hydrochloric acid, is reacted with 10 centimetres cubed of 2 mole sodium hydroxide, the temperature changes delta T. When the reaction is repeated with 50 centimetres cubed of each solution, what would the temperature change be? Okay, well, you've got the same concentration of solution, but you're multiplying the volumes by 5. So this is 50 and 50. So, because you've got um, five times the amount of each solution, you've got five times the energy released. But you've also got five times the volume of water. So therefore, the energy change, the temperature change, sorry, would be the same. Um, because you've got five times the energy, but in five times the solution. Um, so therefore, the, the temperature change is going to be the same. OK. And finally, in an experiment to determine the enthalpy change of combustion of an alcohol, spirit burner containing the alcohol was weighed, lit and placed under a copper can containing a known volume of water. Temperature rise of the water was measured and the burner re-weighed. The enthalpy change calculated from the results was much less exothermic than the value reported in the literature. You did this. You found that your enthalpy changes were about half, if you were lucky, a third typically what you would have expected. What was the biggest cause of the error? There should have been no debate about this. It's the fact that you are losing so much heat from the calorimeter. You need a copper can so it can absorb as much heat as possible from the flame. But the, the quid pro quo of that is it means you are going to lose huge amounts of heat. Lots of you going for B, but that's not a significant cause of error at all. We're talking about values that are 30% of what they should be. And whether or not you've got a, a scale that can re re uh, read to 1 degree C or 2 degree C is not going to make a big difference there. It's not going to certainly knock off two thirds of the value you should get. That, again, is irrelevant. And um, evaporation of the alcohol during the weighing is going to be a minuscule um, factor compared to the heat loss you are losing during this experiment. Again, something I thought I had hammered home quite clearly, and a lot of you hadn't got that. Right, now we're going to move on to the multiple choice, uh, sorry, the longer answer questions that you did at the end of last week. I'm not going to spend as much time on these. Calculate the number of molecules in 5.2 grams of ethanol. First mark is for calculation of the number of moles, which is 1200. Then multiplying that by Avogadro's constant um, gives you the second mark. Write an equation to represent the standard enthalpy change of formation of ethanol. You need to be able to write these. You must have state symbols. Here you go. A correctly balanced equation gets you one mark. Um, all state symbols for one mark. So two carbon, either solid or graphite. That's fine. That's more technically correct. Plus three lots of hydrogen plus half an O2 molecule. Not O gas. Oxygen always goes around in pairs, so it's half an O2 molecule. Goes to C2H5OH liquid. Allow the formula written as C2H6O. Ethanol burns completely. The table shows some mean bond enthalpy data. Calculate the enthalpy change for the complete combustion. 
Well, calculation of the energy needed to break bonds, one mark for 4278, one mark for the energy released, 6004, one mark for the correct um, energy in minus energy out, giving you minus 1276 kilojoules per mole. Complete the reaction profile diagram for the combustion of ethyl, ethanol. Fully label it. This is what you would expect. Products to the right of reactants and to lower enthalpy and the arrow labelled delta CH. Okay, so this arrow clearly going um, between these two energy levels, clearly labelled with the enthalpy of combustion. And the second mark is for the curve going up and down and measuring the activation energy on that. M1 is conditional on exothermic or endothermic value calculated in C1. Okay, so that means if you had calculated it was going to be endothermic, you were allowed to draw an endothermic reaction profile and get both marks. Allow double-headed arrows or lines, but penalise arrows pointing in the wrong direction once only. If you didn't show the enthalpy change going down and the enthalpy uh, activation energy going up, you could have been penalised from that. What's the main reason the data book value is so different? Well, standard enthalpy change of combustion refers to ethanol water as liquids, but bond energies are calculated for gases or change of state data is not included, or ethanol or water are not in standard states for bond enthalpy calculation. So when you're doing your bond energy calculations, you are presuming that you are producing water as a gas, but of course the definition of the enthalpy of combustion um, requires that water is formed as a liquid. Student carries out two experiments to measure the enthalpy change that occurs. Calculate the enthalpy change in solution for anhydrous sodium carbonate. Give your answer to an appropriate number of significant figures. Well, all this data here is given to three significant figures. Um, so we should be thinking three significant figures, um, as is this, as is this, maximum um, two or three. And here's what you have. Calculating the heat evolved during the reaction, MC delta T um, as 1128.6 uh, joules. Calculation of the number of moles used, one mark. Calculation of the enthalpy change of solution, that divided by that, 23.5. Negative sign, so the correct sign and to two or three significant figures gets you the final mark. So minus 23.5 kilojoules per mole would have been perfect. In the second experiment, the student determines the enthalpy change of solution for hydrated sodium carbonate. Complete the Hess cycle. Um, OK, so what you have done is you have dissolved these things in water. So in both of these cases, um, going down to form um, Na2CO3 aqueous plus 10H2O liquids. That's what you've done in both cases. Both arrows in the correct direction and Na2CO3 aqueous plus 10H2O liquid written down here for one mark calculating the answer as minus 53.7 with the correct sign gets you the second mark. Hydrated sodium carbonate slowly loses water of crystallisation when left in air. Explain how the enthalpy change in the second experiment would compare with the data book value if an old sample of hydrated sodium carbonate had been used. Okay, well, so if it has lost water of crystallization, the enthalpy change of solution will be less endothermic than the data book value. Okay, so we know that when it's anhydrous, that it is an exothermic, so anhydrous, but when it is fully hydrated, it is uh, endothermic. So as it loses uh, water, 
then the value is going to become less endothermic, more exothermic, um, because anhydrous sodium carbonate releases war energy when it reacts with water, or because less energy is needed to separate the water molecules from the ions. Okay, some explanation like that. In the experiment, one gram of a hydrocarbon A was burned completely in oxygen to produce 3.143 grams of carbon dioxide, 1.284 grams of water. I bet you'd forgotten about these questions. Uh, in a different experiment, the molar mass of the hydrocarbon A was found to be 84 grams per mole. Calculate the empirical formula and the molecular formula. Okay, so calculating the moles of carbon dioxide and hence the moles of carbon in the compound for the first mark. Calculating the moles of hydrogen um, by working out the moles of water and then doubling it would have got you that. So you'd realise it's a 1 to 2 ratio, so it must have the empirical formula CH2. That's your third mark. You know that the formula mass is 84 grams per mole. So working out some way, whatever method you wanted to use, but it must be C6H12 for the final mark. Hopefully that didn't throw you too much. We've got the practical that you basically did. You've done this one, you've written it up, so you know what's going on. Calculate the enthalpy change of combustion of the hydrocarbon A in kilojoules per mole, appropriate number of significant figures, and include a sign. Uh, our data is given to about three significant figures, but if we look at the temperature change here, um, which is 8.2 degrees C, it may be safer to give our answer to just two significant figures. So, uh, calculation of Q, M, mass of the water, C, delta T, 8.569 kilojoules. Hydrocarbon value burnt in the value of delta CH, so you can work out the mass of that, um, and then you can work out the number of moles of that and then therefore you can divide the 8.569 kilojoules uh, by the uh, so this is essentially the number of moles they've done it in, in uh, one step okay uh, so you do what you would normally expect you work out the number of moles of hydrocarbon and then do minus Q over N, and that will get you the value of delta CH, okay, 2,800 or so. Sign and significant figures, so if you use minus Q over N, you'd end up with minus 2,800 kilojoules per mole, okay, for the final answer. The beaker used in this experiment was made of copper rather than glass, give a reason for this, uh, so that, uh, improved or better heat conduction from the flame to the water. Allow copper is a good conductor of heat, but ignore references to heat lost to the surroundings absorbed by the container, okay? You wouldn't use copper if you were trying to minimise heat loss. Copper radiates heat very quickly. Uh, why 24 magnesium, 26 magnesium are isotopes? Of course, it's all about the fact they've got the same number of protons, but they've got different numbers of neutrons, one mark each. Uh, a sample of magnesium, which contains only the isotopes 24 magnesium and 26 magnesium, has a relative atomic mass of 24.433. What's the percentage abundance of each isotope in the sample of magnesium? So these questions come up fairly regularly. You know that the relative atomic mass is the percentage of isotope 1 times by the mass of isotope 1 uh, plus the percentage of isotope 2 times by the mass of isotope 2, okay? Well, you know that the relative atomic mass is 24.433. Let's call the percentage of 1x, or actually rather the fraction of x, times by 24, which is the mass of isotope 1, plus, well, this has got to be, and it's up to you whether you do 100 minus x, I'm going to do 1 minus x, uh, and call it as a fraction, 1 minus x times by 26, 
So therefore 24.433 equals 24x plus 26 minus 26x and if you solve that equation then you will get the answer so there we go um, this is what they've done there so solving it um, they've used 100 minus x as you can see there um, uh, if you use my method you would have got it as a fraction on the percentage but you end up with the fact that x is 78.35 um, and therefore the percentage of the other one must be 21.65. So uh, one mark for each, uh, one mark actually for the equation to work it out and one mark for the answers. Give the electronic structure of magnesium atom using SPD. Uh, it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2. Equation for the first ionization energy of magnesium, that is magnesium as a gas, remember it's a gas losing an electron, so becoming magnesium plus gas and an electron being released. Explain why the first ionization energy of magnesium is higher than sodium, well it's due to the fact that you've got a higher nuclear charge but the electrons are in the same shell. So ionized or outer electrons are both in the 3s shell, same shell, same shell, basically for one mark, um, but um, magnesium has one more proton, so uh, greater effective nuclear charge. It's pulled more tightly for the second mark. If we look at the last question, explain why magnesium is higher than aluminium. You might expect aluminium to be higher still on account of the fact that, you know, same shell, but you've got even more um, nuclear charges, but, so nuclear charge is greater, but the outer electron is now in a 3p orbital or the 3p subshell, um, and this 3p subshell is higher, a higher energy than 3s for that second mark. Now we get on to the energy stuff. Uh, explain why the enthalpy change of this reaction cannot be determined directly. Well, in order to, to decompose this, you need to heat it. So when heat is supplied to a system, it's very difficult or impossible to measure the heat absorbed by the reaction. Here's another definition, state Hess's law. It's the en that the enthalpy or the heat change of a reaction is independent of the route taken for one mark there. Why do we use excess hydrochloric acid? You answered this experiment, actually, I think it was your CPAC write-up, but it was certainly one of the practicals you wrote up. Why do you need excess hydrochloric acid? Why don't you use excess of the powder? Well, you're measuring the enthalpy change for the solid. So you need all of the solid to react. So, so that all the magnesium carbonate reacts, so that all the solid reacts, but ignore just to ensure complete reaction, because of course it's not complete as far as hydrochloric acid is concerned. The students were told that using a polystyrene cup gave better results than using a glass beaker because of its good thermal insulation and low heat capacity. Why does that improve experimental results? Well, the good thermal insulation reduces heat transfer with the surroundings. Um, uh, reject the idea that it stops all heat loss. I think that's what it's saying. So it reduces heat loss to the surroundings for one mark. And why is it important since it's a low heat capacity? So little energy is used to heat or cool the container. So almost all of the energy is going into heating or cooling the water. Student calculates this. Can you do the same? Yes, of course you can. The change in density Q equals MC delta T. 3.87 kilojoules. Calculate the molar enthalpy change for the reaction between magnesium carbonate and hydrochloric acid. Give your answer to three significant figures. Include a sign and units. Okay, so first mark for working out the molar mass of magnesium carbonate. Um, second mark for working out the number of moles of magnesium carbonate. And then doing minus Q over N. Uh, and then obviously giving it to three significant figures with um, a sign and unit. So minus 130 kilojoules per mole got you the final mark. 
complete this Hess cycle. So you've added magnesium carbonate to acid. Um, and what have you ended up with? Well, you have ended up with magnesium chloride aqueous, H2O liquid, CO2 gas. Don't forget to add the state symbols. Um, and for this, it didn't matter whether you emitted the 2HCl, but it's good practice to have your plus 2HCl on each arrow. Use your completed Hess cycle to calculate the enthalpy change. So it's obviously uh, delta H2, so you're going down. If we go back, in order to calculate this, you're going down this and up against this. So you're going with delta H2 and against delta H3. So hence delta H2 minus delta H3, minus 126 minus minus 231, one mark for setting up the equation, one mark for the correct answer, plus 105 kilojoules per mole. Data but values for delta H2 and delta H3 are this. Most of the values obtained by the students were close to the mean values and they suggested that the difference between their values and those from the data was due to the measurement uncertainties in their experiments. Evaluate the suggestion. Well, if it's due to measurement uncertainties, um, you would expect that actually the values Although there would be quite a difference in the students' values, they would be close-ish to um, the actual values quoted there, but they're not. The fact that the values are so different and yet all the students got close to the ones implies that there is high precision. So precision high, but there's low accuracy. So if we think of that bullseye target analogy, then the students are all off here somewhere. So it means they're all doing the experiment well, but there's an actual problem with the experiment. There's a systematic error. So the students' values were much smaller, less negative than the data, but values which indicates a systematic error. Um, the results obtained by the students are precise but inaccurate. Uncertainties will give values scattered about the true value. So uh, measurement uncertainties will give you a scatter, but it will be around the right arrow, so it can't explain the discrepancy. I hope that was useful. Um, the rest of this week, you'll be looking at Group 7 and Redox. Thank you.